The Last Guardian is the latest game by Fumito Ueda, the visionary director behind Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. You play as a young boy trying to escape from an ancient, abandoned castle. Early on in this adventure, you meet Trico, a giant half-bird, half-mammal hybrid, and it's your relationship with Trico and your ability to work together to escape this castle that make up most of the game. During your time with The Last Guardian, you'll experience some of the worst controls I've ever used in a AAA game. Just moving from place to place with the boy you control is an exercise in patience and frustration. Aside from running, jumping, and climbing with the boy, you'll be attempting to command a giant beast that can explicitly ignore you sometimes for no reason at all. There really aren't many unique gameplay scenarios or systems either. New mechanics are few and far between, and often aren't expanded in any meaningful ways. There's no significant challenge or difficulty to overcome, other than just figuring out which way to go next. On top of all of that, you can expect significant frame drops and performance issues during scripted set pieces and other required parts of the story. And despite all those shortcomings and poor design choices, if you're genuinely interested in this game, I'd still recommend you stop watching this video immediately and play it yourself. I can give you a good summation of the things this game does wrong without spoiling anything of significance. But to explain the thought-provoking story, or how purposefully crafted the world and environments can be, or how stunningly well realized Trico is as an animal companion, would begin to spoil an experience you just can't get in most other games. But I do want to point out that The Last Guardian has had a permanent price drop to $20 and regularly goes on sale on the PlayStation Store. I bought it for $10, and at that price, I'd recommend you try it if any of what I've already said interests you. If you're the kind of person who can look past some exceptionally bad design choices in the pursuit of one of the better video game relationships in recent years, then you owe it to yourself to try this game out. Like I said, it's hard to talk about what this game does well without getting into spoilers. I'm going to be talking about the entire game in this video, so now's your chance to stop watching if you don't want anything spoiled. The game begins without any sort of opening cutscene or explanation. You get a brief glimpse of this glowing green disc buried in the dirt before the opening credits, and then you're playing the game. You wake up in a cave with no idea where you are, how you got there, or why there's these strange black markings all over your skin. You're also trapped in this cave with what the narrator refers to as a giant man-eating beast known as Trico. At first, you're scared of Trico, but you soon realize that it's chained up and injured with spears poking out of its leg and shoulder. You're prompted by the narrator to remove one of these spears and you spend the rest of this introduction nursing Trico back to health, gaining its trust, and finding a way to escape the cave by working together. Before you reach the exit of this cave, you'll be introduced to most of the mechanics that the game has to offer in one way or another. You'll climb around the environment and pull switches to open up new paths, you'll use Trico to reach places or destroy objects that you couldn't on your own, and you'll move from place to place learning more about Trico and this world as you progress. If that doesn't sound like much to do, that's because it isn't. You'll be seeing and experiencing many new environments, but you'll largely be doing the same thing in each one of them, which is trying to find a way out. Like I said, you don't know where you are or how you got there, but your goal is to find a way back to your village. This is made clear by the narrator that speaks throughout the entire game. This is the young boy you play as telling the story of his adventure once he's much older. That's not a spoiler. The narrator constantly speaks in phrases like, I did this, or this happened to me. This gives context to the world and story as you play, but also can help the player explicitly. There are many parts where you might get stuck, not knowing how to solve a puzzle or what to do next, and the narrator will tell you what he did as a way to give you hints. For example, if you spend a few seconds running around this cave without approaching Trico, the narrator will eventually say that Trico was in pain due to the spear sticking out of its flesh. That's your hint to go and remove it. I didn't really like this mechanic at first. If I came face to face with a man-eating beast, I don't think my first reaction would be to approach it. 
and only doing so after the narrator told me to do it made that realization feel cheapened since I wasn't given much of a chance to figure it out on my own. After getting used to it, I can at least say that it was a good way to contextualize a gameplay hint, but I suspect that this feature was added to help players navigate through some confusing level design. I'll get to that in a bit, but before I move on, I should probably tell you about Trico. Trico's kind of a combination of several different types of animals. It's got a lot of bird-like features, like wings and a beak, but it moves around more like a cat and even has a long tail. Despite these physical features, I think most people will agree that Trico felt more like a dog than anything else. I just want to point out that I'm calling Trico an it because we never learn if Trico is male or female, or even if there are multiple sexes of Trico in general. If people want to refer to Trico with a specific gender, that's fine. I think it's never explicitly stated because Ueda wanted the player to identify their version of Trico however they saw fit. If you want Trico to be a boy or a girl, you're free to pick whichever one you like, and no one can tell you that you're wrong. While it's hostile to you at first, it begins to trust you after you nurse it back to health, and it will even follow simple commands. Initially, this just means calling Trico to follow you or stand at your location, but eventually expands to more actions like jumping on top of or grabbing things. You can even make it sit, which was never not super cute. The similarities to a dog don't stop there because Trico is also super needy, and I mean that in the best way possible. Even if you don't call out to it, Trico will almost always be right at your side waiting for you to feed it a barrel or give it some well-deserved pets. That also means that this feathery cat dog comes with pathetic whines and visible anxiety every time you're separated, even if it's just for a little bit. I definitely got the sense that Trico thought once I rounded a corner that I was completely gone and never going to come back. All of these little nuances in Trico's design and behavior made it easy to fall in love. When you make it out of that cave, you get your first look at Trico out in the open, and it's pretty spectacular. Its feathers will individually flow in the wind and shine in the light. You'll get to see it make pinpoint jumps from pillar to pillar as it follows you around, and it even crouches down to avoid messing up the trees. There's not really anything else happening during this part of the game, but it still sticks out in my mind as one of my favorite moments because of how well realized Trico is. These little details and interactions are what sell Trico to you and get you invested in the relationship. It's a good thing that it works because the emotional payoff of this game rests on you caring about Trico and believing that it cares about you. Trico is hands down the best part of this game, and while that shouldn't come as much of a surprise, I still wasn't expecting it to be this effective. I honestly can't think of another game, book, or movie that does a non-speaking animal companion this well, and it does it in a relatively short amount of time. I haven't wanted a fictional creature to be real this much since I was six and I wanted a pet Pikachu. I could go on about how I enjoyed all the little moments like when you play together in some water, or when you find out that its eyes can glow in the dark and light the way, but suffice it to say, Trico is the heart and soul of this experience, and I still find myself thinking about it weeks after reaching the end. But it's not all sunshine and feathers. Trico comes with its own share of problems when traversing levels or solving puzzles. In general, you'll be using Trico to reach places you wouldn't be able to reach on your own. You'll have to point to the place you want Trico to stand or jump on top of, which will usually lead to a lever or a chain that you can pull to open the way for the both of you. My biggest complaints about this system are the inaccuracy of it paired with Trico's knack to ignore your commands. The second part of that complaint is significant because many people who have played the game say that it was done intentionally, that Trico sometimes disobeys your commands to seem more realistic. I want to be clear that I agree with these people and that I even think the idea of this feature, if that's what you want to call it, was a good one. I think it's the implementation of this idea that I don't like rather than the idea itself. What I mean is that there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to when Trico will do what you want it to do and when it won't. There definitely were times that I called for Trico to do something and would look over to see it playing in the grass or scratching its ear, and this never got on my nerves because I could at least see that Trico was preoccupied with something and it would be done in a few seconds. It was the countless other times when Trico simply wouldn't react to my commands at all or would stare at a wall without doing anything. These seemed more like glitches than anything else and they happened far too often. Sometimes I could get Trico close to where I wanted it to go, and then getting it to take that last step seemed impossible. I'd have to climb down and let it reset itself, or something like that. I guess I'll concede that Japan Studio deliberately made this a part of Trico's personality, but I don't think they intended for it to happen as often as it does. A more satisfying and less infuriating version of this idea would involve Trico being more likely to disobey commands early in the game and making it far less common or even non-existent near the end. This would reinforce the idea of you two understanding each other more as you progress. 
I also think Trico should have had more things to do when idle that made it clear why your calls were going unanswered. Of course, this all just pales into comparison to how bad it feels to move around on your own. If you've ever played Eco or Shadow of the Colossus, then you know these developers are no strangers to poor controls. It's almost a calling card for them at this point, but that doesn't make it okay. I'd consider myself pretty tolerant of bad controls in games. Many people complain that they never got used to the button layouts or even just walking around town in Red Dead Redemption 2. While I can admit that Arthur Morgan isn't always the easiest to maneuver with, I never felt like it kept me from enjoying the game, and it only took me a couple of hours to get the hang of it. A lot of people who don't like playing Rockstar games say that it feels more like you're driving the main character than you are directly controlling them. I'd go as far as to say that The Last Guardian feels this way, but even worse, with a genuinely evil camera to boot. Some of the problems I have with the controls are obviously more a matter of circumstance or preference, but there are plenty of these that are deliberate design decisions that make no sense. There are only two movement speeds when you're on foot. You can push the control stick all the way in any direction for a full-on sprint, or you can lightly nudge it to get the game's best impression of Shaggy. A lot of this game's best moments are in between the bigger set pieces where you and Trico are just enjoying each other's company. I'm the kind of person that likes to make my character act how I would act in certain situations, so the fact that there isn't even an option to just walk around at a normal speed was a real bummer. At first this was just a minor annoyance, but by the end this was downright baffling to me. And that's because even though the game gives you this comically slow sneaking animation, there isn't a single moment in the game that requires or even makes it beneficial to walk at this speed. And that's not an exaggeration. When I realized I had the ability to tiptoe like this, I was sure I'd need to sneak past some enemies at some point. Or maybe there'd be a rickety bridge I'd need to slowly cross to avoid falling through. Nothing like this ever happens, and in fact, I don't think there's any functional difference between running or sneaking other than just moving at different speeds. There's only one reason I can think of that would explain why this feature is in the game, and it relates to Fumita Ueda's development philosophy of design by subtraction. Apparently, Ueda will frequently call for certain features or sections to be removed from the games he directs if they don't directly contribute to his vision. I think it's an interesting concept and one I can get behind. So often, it seems like developers add things to games in order to meet some quota rather than to enhance the overall experience. My theory is that early on in development you did have the option to sneak past enemies, but this was removed because it didn't contribute to your relationship with Trico in a meaningful way. While those sections of the game ended up getting axed, the sneaking animation was left in because… well, I don't really know why. Like I said, it's complete speculation and comes from me trying to make sense of a feature that has no purpose. If the clunky controls of the boy are a wrench being thrown into the Last Guardian's gears, then the third person camera is a fucking buzzsaw. Throughout your playthrough, you'll experience all the standard problems that come with poorly implemented cameras. There's a strange momentum to everything, which means I'd often overshoot the thing I was trying to look at. Sometimes the game will prevent you from turning the camera past a wall that doesn't seem like it should block your view, and other times it won't shy away from putting Trico or parts of the environment right in your line of sight. It also has this weird tendency to reset if it thinks you can't see yourself. When this happens, the screen goes black for about half a second and the camera will be directly behind you. There was no way to predict when this would happen, and I found it extremely disorienting every time. The last thing I'll mention is Japan Studio's weird over-reliance on what I'll call camera hooks. You've probably seen these in a bunch of other games. Basically, you'll be walking down a corridor or over a cliff or something like that, and the camera will pull back to give you a better view of something. There are sections of this game that felt like this was happening around every single corner. I'm not really sure what they were going for here. There are maybe a few that I appreciated, but more often than not, it felt like I was just having control of the camera wrestled away from me. It might not sound like that big of a deal, but after this happens for the 20th or even the 30th time, I started to get annoyed at having to move my camera just so I could see where I was going. Worst of all, they sometimes resulted in me mistiming a jump because I couldn't anticipate when it would happen. <gasps> I think I've talked long enough about how some of the most basic controls in this game fundamentally don't make sense, but hopefully that's enough context for you to understand what I'll be discussing in the next section.
I'll be honest, I had a hard time writing the intro for this section of the video. For those of you who have played a game by Fumito Ueda, it might be obvious why that is. But if you haven't played one of his games, I'm just going to lay it all out up front. If you're looking for a game that will challenge you, or a game with a variety of things to do and experience, or even just a game that could generally be described as fun, this isn't that game. That's not to say there isn't any of that stuff to be found here, especially because my idea of fun and your idea of fun might be very different. But in terms of gameplay complexity, variety, and even quality, it's undeniable that these are not among the game's top priorities. I think breaking down the core gameplay loop into its individual components will help you see what I mean. There are only four things you'll be doing in the roughly 10 hours it'll take you to reach the ending. These can be summed up as platforming and climbing, solving puzzles, set pieces, and what could loosely be called the game's combat. If you really want to stretch this list, I guess you could include taking care of and interacting with Trico as part of that loop. I'm not including it because there's only one instance where this is required to progress the story. Every other time is purely voluntary and only results in cosmetic changes. Instead, I'm going to focus on the platforming and climbing you perform on your own. While it has humble beginnings, eventually you'll be ascending some truly massive structures. I have to give credit where it's due, because many of these sections do a great job of communicating the scale of the world. Unfortunately, this increase in size doesn't mean an increase in complexity. Instead of adding multiple routes for you to climb or requiring specific timing, you'll simply be holding the left stick in the direction you're climbing in for longer periods of time, sometimes for a few minutes straight. There's only one exception I can think of, and it's the first time you climb on one of these giant hanging mobiles. It's fairly straightforward until you need to start climbing on the broken shards of glass sticking out from the window. There are multiple dead ends, and you even need to go through holes a couple of times to continue on the other side. After completing this climb, I was excited because I thought it was a preview of how this system would be expanded. If you haven't already guessed, I was wrong to think that. This is probably the most difficult climb in the game, which is extra disappointing because it's still not that hard and you reach it about a quarter of the way through the game. At first, I thought this was a big missed opportunity, but I ended up being relieved that most of the platforming actually got more simplistic near the end. That might sound like I prefer my games to be easy, but it stems more from the confusing level design than anything else. I'm usually the kind of person who refuses to look up guides and opts to figure things out for myself, but I had to seek help online to get through certain parts of this game more often than I'd like to admit. Whenever this happened, I didn't get the feeling you're supposed to get when you realize how you were meant to advance. It was never, how did I not think of that? It was, why would I have ever thought of that? After getting stuck in this watery cave, I had to swim to a specific location so that Trico would unknowingly break through the floorboards and I could climb up its tail. How was I supposed to know to do that? There were also many instances where the only way out of a place was to get on top of Trico and somehow it would know exactly how to progress, but the game doesn't do anything to communicate that to you. It'd be one thing if Trico made some sort of noise to signal that it knew the way forward, but as it stands, I guess you're just supposed to hop on top of Trico once you've exhausted all your other options. It doesn't help that there are a lot of climbable objects and pathways you can find that end up being nothing but time wasters. Sometimes I was so sure that I was going the right way because the game even had things I could interact with, only to find out that it led nowhere. In this section, you're supposed to enter this chamber from an entrance further up above. But there was another, more obvious path below that involved crawling through a small hole and walking along a path lining the walls. There's even this bright ledge you can reach with a jump, but you can't grab onto it. Why was I even allowed to enter the room in this way? I know I said I enjoyed the dead ends present on the stained glass window, but these were dead ends that often required significant climbing to get to. It never took too long to make my way back, but it happened enough times and the boy climbed so slowly that it really started to irritate me whenever it happened. It wouldn't even bother me so much if it wasn't for the blue symbols that sometimes mark the way forward. The key word here is sometimes. As far as I could tell, there wasn't any sort of logic as to when they would show up. They'd appear in places that seemed extremely obvious to me, but during some of the most confusing sections, they'd be mysteriously absent. I could appreciate it more if there was something in the lore to explain them, but it's one of the few things implemented purely as a gameplay device, and it isn't contextual to the story in any way that I could find. 
Before I move on to puzzle solving, I want to give a special shout out to the sequence where you're trapped in a cage and you have to roll around like a hamster ball. You're able to move on flat surfaces, but if a ledge or something in the environment gets in your way, you need Trico to push you over it. I think it's only intended for you to be in this cage for a couple of minutes. On my first playthrough, I got stuck between the wall and this other cage through some sort of maneuver I couldn't even pull off again if I tried. I spent the next 5 minutes meticulously inching my way out of this trap because Trico for some reason refused to push me no matter how hard I begged. I also couldn't reload my save because I had just spent several painful minutes rolling my way here and there was no way to tell how far back the most recent checkpoint would have sent me. Things like this really irritated me and I had to stop playing on more than one occasion due to rising blood pressure. I can talk about the puzzle part of the gameplay loop relatively quickly because there frankly just aren't that many of them. That is, unless you also count finding out ways to open gates or destroy the anti-trico symbols. I personally don't consider these puzzles because they're so simplistic and there's never any variation on them. If you come up on a closed gate or some other obstacle that looks like it could be moved, all you have to do is look around until you find a lever or a chain to pull. Sometimes you'll need to use your mirror to activate one of these obelisks, but functionally it's the exact same thing. The most you'll ever have to think during these sections is at this gate. You need Trico to jump into the water, which will make a small wave that lets you reach the lever above. The fact that I'm pointing this out as an exceptionally complex gate to open should speak for itself. Similarly, when you see one of these anti-Trico symbols, you always have to find a way to destroy them. This was always trivially easy to do, and it only got easier later on when you can do it from afar with the green mirror. What I consider the true puzzles of The Last Guardian are the few times you have movable objects that you need to put in certain places or get Trico to interact with in order to move forward. Again, you're never going to be amazed by the solution to any of these, but they at least require some critical thinking to complete. There's only one of these that sticks out in my mind. It involves this cauldron of the green liquid that Trico's obsessed with. You solve it by bringing in this cauldron from another room and hanging it on this chain. You get Trico to pull on it and it raises the gate to the next area. On the other side, you have to turn this cylindrical thing on its side and wedge it underneath the gate. That way, Trico has enough room to get through as well. This is one of the most complicated puzzles in the game, which is pretty sad. None of them are really interesting enough to talk about, so I'm just going to skip over most of them. But before I move on, I should probably talk about these barrels. They're scattered throughout the levels, and you can optionally find them and feed them to Trico. These are the game's collectibles, and while they're sometimes hidden, many of them are left out in plain sight. The few that aren't immediately obvious are still really easy to find. Most sections of the game conclude with set pieces, which I consider the third major portion of gameplay. Initially, I wasn't planning on including these because most of them are closer to cutscenes than anything else, but there are some near the end of the game with interactive moments. Most of these involve riding on Trico while you both escape some collapsing structure, and while they're all visually impressive, they were also where I experienced the worst performance. There's this one sequence where you have to run through this collapsing tunnel and Trico catches you at the end. It would have been great if the game had managed to maintain something even resembling a solid frame rate. I guess it also didn't help that immediately afterwards Trico sent me to the Shadow Realm. Trico? <laughs> what the fuck, Trico? Still, there are a few that stood out to me as being particularly good, like when you have to jump from this wooden bridge and trust that Trico will catch you, and later on when you have to do the same thing again, but Trico misses, only to catch you with its tail. It's exciting and works because Trico's face and body language effectively communicate that it wants you to jump without any words or button prompts. It also has a good setup earlier when you throw some barrels at Trico and it catches them in midair. It's a shame that this tail catch fake out is used again later because it makes the first time feel a little bit less special. Just goes to show that if you repeat anything in a game this short, it's not going to leave much room for things to breathe. There's only one more gameplay element I've yet to bring up. I saved it for last because I have the most to say about it. It involves these possessed suits of armor that you encounter in almost every part of the game. When you enter their line of sight, they spring to life and begin chasing you down. If they catch you, they'll hoist you over their shoulders and attempt to take you through one of these blue doorways, and if they succeed, it's game over and you have to reload to the last checkpoint. The goal is, of course, to not get grabbed in the first place, but if you do get grabbed, you can escape their grasp with some button mashing. And I don't mean the usual definition of button mashing, where there are some advanced combos or sequences you could enter, but they're just too complicated for most people to memorize. 
I mean, you are literally supposed to pull both triggers and mash the four face buttons as quickly as you can in order to break free. There's no challenge here, it's just a few seconds of finger banging your controller until you clear all these symbols from your screen. What's worse is that it's not a set number of inputs to satisfy this requirement, because as you clear the symbols from your screen, more will begin to pop up. So you're forced to press all these buttons as fast as you can every time you get grabbed, and that's your only interaction with this enemy type. The first time you encounter these guards, you have to run back to Trico and hide while it fights them for you. I didn't realize it at the time, but this was a blueprint for every other combat scenario the game throws at you. And it throws them at you a lot. Whenever you see these suits of armor, the only thing that makes sense for you to do is run, hide, and let Trico kill them for you. This is just blatantly unfun. I don't think the developers realize this either. Just listen to the music that plays during these parts of the game. That's some pretty badass music for basically just standing there doing nothing. You essentially stop playing the game for however long it takes Trico to take them out. Which wouldn't be so bad if it didn't seem like at times Trico was outright refusing to kill them. Sometimes they can be killed with a single swipe, but most of the time they'll need to be knocked down before Trico can stomp on them. If they get pushed into the geometry in some way, or if Trico just decides to move on to the next target, they'll stand back up and resume fighting. You'll have to wait for Trico to eventually knock them down again, and then hopefully follow through this time. There are only two mix-ups on this formula, one of which is on the simple side, and another that kind of doesn't even work. Partway through the game, you'll see some suits of armor that hold these shields with the symbol that Trico's afraid of. You'll have to run up to them and push them so that they drop the shields and Trico can resume fighting. This is a really simplistic enemy type that's dealt with after a single button press, but at least it gives you something to do at the beginning of the fight, rather than just stand there and wait. There is one more way you end up getting to interact with the guards, and it involves this green mirror you find in the cave at the very beginning of the game. When you equip this mirror and aim it, Trico's tail will shoot lightning at the place you're aiming. That's right, Trico can shoot lightning. Out of its tail. At first, you just use this to destroy objects blocking your path. Right before your first encounter with the suits of armor, you lose this mirror, and it's not returned to you until about two-thirds into the game. After this point, you can use the mirror to shoot lightning at them. At first, this might sound like a good thing, but it's not. Once again, it's the poor camera controls that make aiming the lightning a fucking nightmare. Not only is it difficult to aim, the balls of lightning won't shoot out of Trico's tail unless you aim in the same spot without moving for a few seconds. This just blatantly doesn't work with the way the enemies are designed, and it feels like Japan Studio didn't even playtest their own game. To aim the mirror, you have to stand still, and standing still is a surefire way to make sure you get grabbed. Even if you do find those precious few seconds where you aren't being hunted down and get an opportunity to aim, you're likely to miss through no fault of your own. Like I said, the lightning will only shoot out once you've aimed at the same spot for a few seconds, but since the suits of armor are constantly moving, the chances that your target is in the same place as when you started aiming are slim to none. The worst part about all of this is that the mirror and the lightning didn't always function like this. When you had this weapon early in the game, it shot out a constant stream of lightning that would go wherever you aimed the mirror. It isn't until after you have the mirror returned to you that Trico's tail shoots out intermittent balls of lightning rather than a constant stream. It's never explained why this change happens. If I had to guess, I'd say the developers thought the game would be too easy if you could just aim a never-ending lightning bolt at the enemies. But then again, there's nothing else in the game that's really trying to be challenging. The entire experience is incredibly easy except for when the controls get in your way. The last thing I'll say about the suits of armor is that there is actually a hidden way for you to help Trico fight them. When they get knocked onto the ground, you can run up to them and pull their helmet off to defeat them for good. I say this is a hidden interaction because there's nothing in the game that explicitly tells you this is possible. There is a button prompt that appears when you approach a downed guard, but that's not an effective way to communicate this to the player for a reason I'll get to in just a second. I think there are only two ways that you could reasonably infer that removing the helmets from fallen guards is possible. The first happens a few times later in the game. You have to activate a suit of armor by bringing it a loose helmet somewhere else in the level. 
I can see how some people might realize that the reverse could be true as well, that if you remove the helmets, it would shut them down. I never made this connection, mostly because of this animation. It gets forcefully ripped out of the boy's hands against his will, so what kind of logic would lead me to believe he's capable of removing helmets already tethered to a body? The second way you might realize that you can do this is through one of the game's trophies. I wouldn't normally think of the trophy list as a place to learn about core game mechanics, but again, it's never told to the player in any other way. In fact, there are probably some of you watching who played through the entire game and never realized this was an option. I didn't know it was something I could do until my second playthrough. I bet there's someone at Japan Studio who's really proud of this because they think it's satisfying when the player figures it out on their own. I don't think I can overstate just how much I disagree with this decision. I want to explain this in a way that will make sense to people who haven't played the game and haven't had to endure these combat sections. Imagine you work in an office and that a significant amount of your job is data entry. In this scenario, your job is actually not that bad. You get to climb up the corporate ladder, spend time around the water cooler, and you're even good friends with one of your coworkers. But the worst part of your day is when you sit down and enter repetitive data into an Excel sheet for a couple of hours. You have to do this every day, and even though your job is mostly fine, this one aspect of it is so bad and so boring that you often think about quitting. Now, imagine that after working this job for years and eventually moving on to another position, you learn about Excel shortcuts. Wow. These shortcuts are significant time savers. They make this part of your job go by two, three, maybe even four times as fast. You burst into your boss's office to explain what you just learned, only for your boss to say, Ha ha! I knew about the shortcuts the whole time. I could have told you, but aren't you glad you figured it out on your own? I think most people's reaction would be something like this, and they'd be right to do so. How much time did I waste watching the worst parts of this game over and over again without knowing I could have made them go by that much faster? Maybe the developer thought players would just stumble upon this button prompt by chance, but the first thing the game teaches you about the suits of armor is to avoid them. During the second encounter you have with the guards, I tried to help Trico by running up and pushing them. I even had the right idea here, that with Trico by my side, maybe there was something I could do to help. But of course, this just resulted in me getting grabbed and being forced to play my least favorite version of Whack-A-Mole. I tried to help Trico, and I got instantly punished for it, so I just never tried again. Simply having a button prompt appear when you get close to the downed guards isn't an effective way to communicate this mechanic because the game does such a good job early on at discouraging this kind of behavior. After my first failed attempt, I spent every subsequent encounter as far away from the action as possible. That's what I thought I was supposed to be doing. This was a real low point. In a game that's already so bare in terms of interaction and challenge, it's hard to believe that this is what made it into the final release. There's no doubt in my mind that the game would strictly be better if these encounters were never there in the first place. I've been pretty negative so far. There's a lot that I dislike about this game, but most of that is in the gameplay. The story is a lot better, so let's just move on. IU Labo, OT Ukaya, Anetu Tara, Ate de Kida Lozi, Adatu, Olozi, a Wokuku. O Mara Genara Woso, Naku Bastizi, Awizi. Yeah, it's definitely better. There are two stories that The Last Guardian wants to tell. The first is the adventure you share with Trico in search of a way back home. The second story is everything that happened long before the start of the game. Before I can talk about that second one, you need to know the answers to those questions I mentioned in the first section of the video. Namely, where are you and how did you get there? That first one is half answered early on when the narrator says that even though he didn't know it at the time, he was in Trico's nest. If you're particularly observant, then this is a strong hint towards one of the game's later reveals. Telling Trico where to go and leading it from place to place should have made you stop and ask another question. If this is Trico's nest, why doesn't it seem to know where it's going? And why would it decide to live in such a hostile place? It's possible you could start to figure this out the first time you encounter one of these green beacons. It emits a signal that causes Trico to eat you. When this happens, you have a muddied, chopped up vision before waking up to a familiar scene. Looking back, it's hard to believe this didn't set off any alarms in my brain, but I wasn't sure how I was supposed to interpret what just happened. 
Did Trico actually eat me, or was the game showing me a false narrative? After blacking out, the beacon never turned back on, so there was no way to be sure. Those questions are laid to rest later when this exact same sequence of events happen again, only this time you get to see the whole vision. Only it's not a vision, it's a memory you had forgotten. In it, you learn that Trico kidnapped you from your village in order to bring you back to its nest, but on the flight back, it got caught in a storm and was struck by lightning. After crashing down to the valley floor, the suits of armor carried it down to the cave without knowing that you were inside of it. They place a chain around Trico's neck, you get spat out, and that brings you back to the beginning of the game. Reading that back now, it might sound like Trico did this to you intentionally, and that maybe it just lost its memory but it's pretty clear that it was actually being controlled by someone or something. The beacons you come across that cause Trico to eat you, the anti-Trico symbols being clear examples of negative reinforcement training, and, most notably, the several encounters you have with the other hostile Trico. Maybe a third of the way into the game you get your first glimpse at another Trico off in the distance. It doesn't seem to notice you, and it's not until a set piece later that you get to see it in a full suit of armor identical to the broken armor your Trico wore at the beginning. There are two reasons to believe that it's this armor that causes Trico's to be under some sort of mind control. The first is that the Trico's wearing the armor always have their pink eyes, which they usually only have when they're agitated. It's almost like they're always set to attack mode or something. You can see this in both the evil Trico and your Trico in the Forgotten Memory. The second is that in the final encounter with this Trico, it stops being hostile and immediately has its normal eye color as soon as you destroy its helmet. It's important to realize this, otherwise the remaining quarter of the game where you and Trico continue to work together wouldn't make any sense. I think it's deliberate that after this second vision we get to see Trico wake up before you do. Not only is this scene of Trico carrying around your limp body touching, it's there to make sure you don't have any doubts that your Trico is actually good and cares about you even when you're not watching. You also get to see Trico do some really cute tippy taps. Yeah, it was definitely mind control. Fast forward to a couple of hours later and you finally reach the top of this tower which you and Trico can use to fly out of the valley. Along the way, Trico's wings have been healing and it's slowly been regaining the ability to fly. I also wanted to point out that for anyone wondering why you haven't just been waiting for Trico to be healthy enough to fly up until this point, that you need to reach the top of the tower because it's the only area in the valley that is both high up and large enough for Trico to get a running start. It's established that Trico can't just fly from a standstill a few minutes earlier. It's during this puzzle where you're erecting two bridges that seem to go nowhere, only to realize that you were building a runway the whole time. You eventually make your way to the top, but not before coming face to face with what the narrator calls the Master of the Valley. It's this black and green orb surrounded by some kind of dark energy at the center of the tower. You arrive at the top and get to spend a few minutes alone with Trico before experiencing the end of the game. It's the calm before the storm. The tower broadcasts a signal using another green beacon, only this one seems to have a significantly larger range because it ends up summoning dozens of other Tricos that fly in from the skies. They land and immediately sacrifice their own kidnapped humans to the master of the valley. No doubt what your Trico was also supposed to do before it was struck by lightning. And as a reward for their sacrifice, each Trico is given a barrel as a treat. The same barrels you have been finding and feeding to your Trico. When they notice you, the other Tricos try to eat you too, but of course your Trico comes to defend you. What follows is the longest and most complicated set piece in the game, involving avoiding enemy Tricos and even catching a joyride as you attempt to save your Trico from the angry mob. Eventually, you have to drag Trico's severed tail back down into the tower and use it to destroy the master of the valley, nearly killing yourself in the process. This causes all the other Tricos to lose their minds. They fall from the skies or simply walk off the edge of the tower in confusion. Your Trico finds your unconscious body and together you fly out of the valley. It takes you back to your village, but it's not the welcome party you might have hoped for. Even after returning you, the other villagers are understandably afraid of and threaten to kill Trico. You're on the verge of death and can barely speak, so Trico has to fly away, never to be seen again. A 
ゴッジアジュクイファイト There's a scene after the end credits. Decades later, some children end up finding the lost, forgotten mirror you used to save Trico. It turns out the narration you've been hearing has been this much older version of the young boy telling this story to these children. After shining the mirror into the sky like the bat signal, you're treated to a shot of the same cave where your story began with not just one, but two pairs of Trico eyes shining in the dark. It's a touching and hopeful conclusion, especially because now it's possible that our Trico may not be the last of its kind. The most likely scenario is that our Trico and the formerly evil slash mind controlled Trico found each other and have been living together ever since we were separated. You even get to see on your flight out of the valley that this other Trico was the only other one to survive, since you already destroyed its helmet earlier. I've read some speculation online that this second pair of Trico eyes actually belongs to a baby Trico because they're smaller. But there are a couple of holes in that theory. Like any animal species, there are bound to be small differences from animal to animal. That means this smaller set of eyes could just belong to a slightly smaller adult Trico. Not only that, it's usually good practice to interpret things based on the developer or director's intent. The fact that we get a specific shot of this other Trico confused but obviously still lucid tells me that we're supposed to believe that it also survived due to not wearing its helmet when we destroyed the Master of the Valley. There's a deliberate connection made between you and this specific second Trico. The narrator even says at several points that it's the exact same one from before. I suppose it's possible that our Trico now has a baby, but this would either mean that it was pregnant the whole time we were together, or that it ended up mating with the second Trico we saw at the end. As far as I could tell, there's nothing in the game to support the idea that Trico was pregnant. And if the two Tricos that we know survived did end up mating, where's that other one now? Did it die sometime after giving birth? And how are we supposed to know that the first set of eyes even belonged to our Trico? Maybe it's the other one that survived instead. It's all too confusing, and I don't think that's the intent of this scene, so it's best to just take it at face value that these two adult Tricos are the last of their kind. So that's the story of the game in its entirety. Whether or not you like it will completely depend on how you feel about Trico, but if you made it all the way to the end, it's probably safe to assume that you cared for Trico quite a bit. I think it's a pretty good ending, and I'm pretty happy to see that it survived because hopefully our characters could one day reunite. That's all well and good, but what I think is more interesting to discuss is everything about this story that we don't ever get to see. You're meant to have a lot of questions once you start playing, but to me, it seemed like every time one was answered, there were several more that took its place. What is the Master of the Valley? Was it and the surrounding architecture created by something or someone? Why are Trico's brainwashed into collecting children and sacrificing them? None of these have definitive answers represented in the game world, but there are certain connections and logical stepping stones that start to paint a clearer picture. The biggest curveball that's thrown your way is your introduction to the Master of the Valley, because it gives you a singular cause for almost everything you've experienced up until this point. It's housed in the tower that Trico's deposit their victims into. It controls the most powerful beacon in the valley. It even shoots out the same magical symbols as the suits of armor when they try to capture you. In fact, if you look closely, you can even see that the doorways they try to take you through lead directly to the master's chamber. So why is it doing all of this? What does it gain by enslaving Trico's and hunting down humans? Are its motives self-serving, or is it possible that it was programmed to do all of this? There are a lot of hints to suggest that humans once lived in the valley. For one, I don't think a distinctly inhuman entity like the Master would choose anthropomorphic suits of armor as its line of defense. It seems more like something that was retrofitted from what was laying around when humans still controlled the valley. It's possible that this race of people could even still live on in some way through their suits of armor. The Master controls the Trikos through their armor, maybe it does the same thing for the souls of this valley's former inhabitants. Another clue is that you can find old Trico statues in some of the levels. Statues are a purely human creation. They're often used to revere something of importance. It's solid proof that humans not only built this ancient city, but that they may have also worshipped Trikos. This is just one instance of the religious symbolism that is frankly rampant in The Last Guardian. So, I want you to recontextualize everything you know about this story through the lens of religion. We start in the lowest, darkest part of the valley with the goal of reaching the top. On the way, we overcome many challenges and achieve a sort of enlightenment. And what's waiting for us when we arrive? 
an incomprehensible master of everything and a legion of loyal disciples with feathery wings. There are actually a striking number of similarities between Trico's and Angel's. I bet you didn't think you'd be getting a theology lesson when you clicked on this video, but by God, you're about to get one. Not only are angels traditionally depicted as having bird-like wings, they would also usually be drawn wearing suits of armor since they're thought to be the literal army of God. In this army, there are many ranks of angel. I guess they get promoted if they 360 no-scope enough demons or something like that. One of these is the rank of guardian angel. You've probably heard about these in pop culture, but you might not have realized that they're recognized as a legitimate type of angel among Abrahamic religions. Unsurprisingly, one of their main jobs is to guide and protect human beings and not just any Joe Schmo. It's believed that guardian angels are assigned to specific human beings and that they share a deep spiritual connection. If this is what Ueda was going for, the lines about the boy being a chosen one would start to make more sense. When Trico comes to your village, it's specifically looking for you. You even have the same pink eyes as Trico in this scene to show it was meant to find this one particular child. The last similarity I'll point out is that up until the 19th century, most artists were deliberate in making sure that angels were never depicted as male or female. This came from the belief that angels are wholly spiritual beings and therefore have no need for gender. I know this was the work of a primarily Japanese developer, so there's a chance I'm just projecting my limited western point of view on it, but the religious imagery only became more obvious as I progressed. Ueda's games also tend to contain messages about the human connection to nature and the importance of living in harmony together. It's easy to see that come through in a game about befriending an animal companion, but I couldn't shake the idea that all of this religious imagery wasn't just a coincidence. I think it begins to make the most sense when you look at the characters in this story, specifically the master of the valley and the young boy, as embodiments of two different sets of religious beliefs. On one side, we have the representation of Western religious tropes like heaven and hell, God and his angelic followers. And while we don't know much about the boy or his people, you can clearly see his clothing is inspired by traditionally Eastern religious robes. It makes even more sense when we look at teachings of humanity's role in nature within each of these religions. Christianity and other Western religions often teach humanocentrism, the idea that humans are the most important entities in the universe. That's not to say that all sects of Christianity believe this, but it's inarguably common. If you want to get into scripture, and I know you do, a passage in Genesis says, And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Sound familiar? Meanwhile, if we look at the teachings of Buddha, we see a marked difference in humanity's role and responsibility over the natural world. Buddhists follow a moral and ethical code of living based on the five precepts. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments in Christianity. And the very first precept states that all Buddhists should abstain from harming any living being on the path to enlightenment. When you also take into account the concept of karma and the possibility of being reincarnated into all forms of life, you can see a much stronger focus on not only living in peace with nature, but actively protecting it. Extending this literally to the events we see in the game, we have a race of people who use the power of the master for selfish gain. They wanted to build a great city, have dominion over every living thing, and perhaps even attain eternal life in their suits of armor. They sacrifice not only their connection with nature, but their humanity to obtain this power. In contrast, you were able to escape your prison and end all of this suffering by working together with and actively protecting your one connection to the natural world. I don't think the point of all of this is to say that Christianity is bad and Buddhism is good. It's not that simple, and if I really wanted to go down the rabbit hole, I'd note that Trico's story resembles that of a fallen angel. That would mean the young boy is the literal embodiment of the devil. I guess that sort of makes sense, after all your actions do lead to essentially the destruction of God and heaven, but again, I don't think that's the artist's intent. I think it's more of a commentary on our duty to preserve the natural world, and how religion can often shape and control our views on that idea. If you disagree with that, well, good. I kind of think of this game as like a form of abstract art, and much like Trico's ambiguous gender, I think you're supposed to derive whatever meaning you want from it. I hope I made it clear what I both loved and hated about this game. 
From the perspective that games are supposed to be challenging and something that the player should have fun with, it fails in spectacular fashion. I really can't stress enough how much some of these design flaws detract from the overall experience and contribute to me never wanting to replay it. All that being said, look, I don't think it's a completely fair comparison, but I went back and played Shadow of the Colossus for this review. But the first time I played it was on a demo disc I got in the mail with the October 2005 issue of the official US PlayStation Magazine. I played that demo and beat the first Colossus more times than I could even count. After convincing my mom to drive me to GameStop, I think I beat the whole game in a single weekend. As a child, I couldn't fully appreciate the beauty of the world, the immaculate detail in each one of its 16 colossi, the pure originality just oozing out of this game. So when it had a remastered release on the PS3 back in 2011, I bought it and played it again. It was like experiencing it for the first time. I remember having that same feeling of childlike wonder, just in awe of everything that it does well. And that brings me to the point that I want to make. In preparation for this video, I went and played the newest version, the remake. And after playing through The Last Guardian, one thing became shockingly clear. I had remembered everything good about this experience, but had obviously forgotten all of its shortcomings. The controls felt stiff and cumbersome, the camera was abysmal, and while I didn't really experience it in the remake, I know the original suffered its fair share of technical and performance issues. My point is, when a game, or book, or movie, or whatever, gives you a one-of-a-kind experience, you tend to look past those blemishes and only remember the parts you enjoy. In Shadow of the Colossus, I think it's fair to say these are more than blemishes. Some of them are more like horrific deformities. But it's still considered a classic because of how it made people feel and how it shaped the debate on games as an art form. And while I wouldn't say it's of the same quality, maybe a few years from now I'll look back on The Last Guardian with a similar form of rose-tinted glasses. God only knows it could use them.